Well, it's October. That means it's time for me to watch movies that scare me silly. And normally that means fictional horror films, but I recently did watch a different kind of scary movie, a Hulu documentary called Monster Inside, America's Most Extreme Haunted House. And I expected this to just be, uh, you know, a behind the scenes look at a particularly scary haunt, but it turned out to be much scarier because it's actually about a guy, Russ McCamey, who seems to be a demented sadist who runs a haunted house experience as maybe a cover for legally, maybe, torturing vulnerable people, maybe for his own kink, including possibly sexually assaulting one participant. So it's a pretty disturbing movie, but I did enjoy how it got really into the psychology involved on both sides. The psychology of the guy who comes up with and performs all this sadistic shit. But even more interesting is the psychology of the people who willingly sign up to do it. You know, they look over a 40-page waiver that makes it almost impossible for them to sue if they are severely injured or hospitalized, as one participant apparently was. One review I read of Monster Inside describes the participants as a specific thrill-seeking personality type, which... I think is actually the wrong way to put it. So there's been a lot of research on why we seek out scary experiences for pleasure, but some of my favorite studies come from the Recreational Fear Lab at Aarhus University in Denmark. That's right, it's a whole laboratory just devoted to the scaries. The thing about recreational fear is it's everywhere. People do many different things to derive pleasure from fear, but it's also poorly understood. So we need uh, systematic scientific investigations of this phenomenon. Recreational Fear Lab is a research unit that is put into the world to conduct scientific investigations of recreational fear. Last year, they published a study that described three types of horror fans. The first of which is that thrill seeker. This is the type of person who gets an immediate positive reaction from the rush of adrenaline. And the mood boost that they get from that is the reason why they come back again for another haunted house tour or another horror film or whatever. And that makes sense. You know, it's certainly what I used to imagine when I pictured the typical horror fan. But the researchers say that that's actually the minority of the horror fans they interviewed. The second type of horror fan is what I think I am. Uh, they call it the white knuckler. The director of the Fear Lab writes that the white knuckler also loves horror, but for them, it's not so much a question of intense stimulation as it is a challenge in keeping fear at a tolerable level. They employ a range of emotion regulation strategies to manipulate their own fear, as we have shown in another haunt study, and intriguingly, they feel that they learn something important about themselves and that the experience allows them to develop as a person. They may feel that they learn about their own stress threshold, for instance, or that they get to practice and hone their ability to suppress anxiety. And that makes sense to me because I consider myself a bit of a wimp when it comes to scary movies. Like, I feel legitimately bad for the camp counselors who are being torn limb from limb. Horror comedies tend to be my favorite because they allow me to release some stress by laughing. But honestly, I still get nightmares after I watch things like Evil Dead or Shaun of the Dead or Cabin in the Woods. The only time I can actually relax and enjoy a horror film is if the people who are dying are terrible and they deserve it. Like the Nazis in Green Room or the Nazis in Becky or, or honestly any horror film where Nazis die, five stars, very relaxing to watch. Yet I still watch scary movies where the victims are likable people, even though it's hard for me to watch them. So why do I do it? I mean, this study makes sense to me, you know, um, I learn coping mechanisms, I have to regulate my own anxiety, I'm like kind of practicing 
for when the real world gets scary in a weird way. The third type of horror fan that this study describes is the dark coper. And this is what I think best describes those people who sign up for these extreme haunts. The Fear Lab director describes this type of person as someone who reaps all the benefits, reporting a mood boost as well as self-insight and personal development. Many dark copers have psychological issues and actively use horror entertainment as a kind of self-medication. For instance, to manage anxiety or treat the symptoms of depression. They report using horror to navigate a world that they perceive to be scary. Monster Inside interviews several participants who agreed to let this guy torture them, and for the most part, I mean, with the exception of one guy who went specifically to expose the whole thing as a scam, it does seem that they chose participants who were younger and vulnerable. So they're not just looking for a cheap thrill. I think they are looking for a kind of therapy. They're exercising their demons, so to speak. And, you know, they live in the United States for the most part, where... We don't give people therapy for free. Now, obviously, those horror fan categories aren't hard and fast. And let's be honest, any truly surprising results, which I don't think this is, but any truly surprising result coming out of places like Fear Lab absolutely is going to require replication before we take it seriously. I personally, though, think that that third category of dark copers, I think that's just a more extreme version of most of us or even all of us. Like the Fear Lab researchers point out that humans find joy in fear from the time we're born. What is peekaboo if not a jump scare for someone without object permanence? And as we grow, we chase each other around in games of tag where, you know, it's basically just a nonviolent version of it coming to get you. And that doesn't prove that we evolved to find joy and fear. It doesn't necessarily prove it's an adaptive trait, but it does raise the question of whether or not using fear in safe situations is something that helps us. Like maybe experiencing fear in a safe way uh, helps us deal with real life scary situations, helps us better cope with different kinds of real life horror. You know, the morality brigade always worries about things like horror leading to desensitization, but what if that's not the risk, but the benefit? And sure enough, you know, Fear Lab did find that horror fans experience less psychological distress at the start of the COVID pandemic. Maybe they inoculated themselves by playing with fear and uncertainty, enabling them to learn coping mechanisms in a safe environment. And yeah, replication on this one would also be nice. The problem, of course, as Monster Inside illustrates, is that what if the safe place to feel that fear isn't actually safe at all? All of which brings me to this conclusion – Please don't travel to bumfuck Tennessee to have a weird creep torture you for seven hours because you thought his TikTok looked cool. If you're at that point, maybe it's time to find some therapy. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you loved the video, please subscribe. And if you think the world could use more videos like this and you happen to have a few bucks laying around, head to patreon.com slash Rebecca and join an awesome community of nerds like the people whose names you see on the screen right now. Thanks.